thing. Um, I'm going to be talking about three hacks in 30 minutes. Um, now, the links to Laura and Anna are actually quite tenuous here. Um, I think we've got a lot to learn from previous mistakes we've made in the Internet of Things and carry them over to LoRaWAN. Um, I'm not going to badmouth LoRaWAN. I think it's an absolutely brilliant technology. I think it's what's going to enable us to have a genuine Internet of Things where we have devices absolutely everywhere communicating freely at low to zero cost in terms of money, maybe in power there's some cost. Um, but I do think it has some security concerns. Um, so what, what I'm basing this on was a paper that was released by a company called IOActive, who are another pen testing firm similar to the one I work for. Um, and they, they released this paper called Loran Networks Susceptible to Hacking. Um, now, I think the paper was maybe sen sensationalized a little bit. Um, it was it presented problems we've seen before, but applied to LoRaWAN and made it like they were specific to LoRaWAN. And I'm going to go through these bit by bit and hopefully convince you that we need to consider security when we're trying to build these massive distributed networks of sensor nodes. So the first one I'm going to talk about is physical access. Now, the particular attack I'm going to talk about here is a thermostat ransomware attack. So we saw this tweet on the Internet. This was back in 2014, so a long time ago. And there was a hashtag going about on Twitter, complaints from the future. And this person came along with one that said, my Nest thermostat has been locked by ransomware. It's the money $300 in 24 hours. Now, the thing was, was that ransomware was really kind of reaching that peak of like media interest at that point. No one had really heard of it before outside of InfoSec. Um, and ransomware had really piqued people's interest. And someone mentioned ransomware on an IoT device. And we thought, well, let's make that real. Let's actually do that. So the thing was, we didn't want a level playing field. We wanted to buy a device that would be vulnerable, that we could ransomware. And what we found was this lovely Venstar thermostat. So it's got this massive color screen. It was, uh, I think it's 800 by 600. So, you know, it's a glorious color display. Um, it's very common in the US. Um, hundreds of reviews on Amazon quite a popular device. The thing was, normally we rely on what's called the FCC documentation. So the FCC, the Federal Communications uh, Committee, I think, I forget. Essentially, if you build any device that transmits any RF in the US and sell that, you have to have it FCC certified. And um, normally that gives us a lot of information. So here you can see a picture of that PCB. And um, well, it doesn't really give us much information at all. All of the interesting stuff is underneath that shielding cam. So we couldn't really see what was going on. Um, we took a punt and we bought one. Um, it wasn't cheap, took three weeks to arrive. But what we found when we opened it was it was running a, a powerful Atmel ARM processor, so an 8091 SAM, really quite a chunky processor. Had 128 megabytes of RAM and a gigabit of flash. So it was a very, very capable de device. I'm not sure why I did bytes and bits there, anybody's guess. It had a little uh, integrated Wi-Fi module. So that little silver chip there labeled U8 is the Wi-Fi module. It's smaller than my, my little fingernail. Absolutely incredible they can fit all of that stuff into that tiny, tiny little device. Um, the tiny little antennas right next to it, that X1 device, very, very small. Um, it had a lot of attack surface. So they're the ways that we can go into a device. So it had an SD card slot. So you could put an SD card into the slide of it. That means it's got a file system. It's got something capable of handling files of that file system. It also had a serial header or a header on it. Um, that allowed us to access a serial console, but it was output only. So we could see what the device was doing, but we couldn't input anything to it. We couldn't find any uh, JTAG or, or debug interfaces to the device. But that's not to really stop us. You know, we wanted to keep on going. So what we did was we downloaded uh, an Adobe Air application that allows you to configure this thermostat. And it lets you do things like set the background on the thermostat, change the schedules, the, the stuff you'd expect for a thermostat. But also down the bottom there, you've got firmware. So this allowed you to update the firmware on the device. And the way it did that was it copied a firmware image from the application through to the SD card. You put the SD card into the thermostat, asked it to read the, the SD card and it would update the firmware. So now we've got a file that represents all or some of the firmware on the device. Now, when we get that, 
and if anybody saw me do the talk a few years ago on uh, a Samsung smart camera, um, it's exactly the same tool. Um, we use the tool called Binwalk to unpack that firmware. So it looks at a single file and it says, it looks for magic numbers, signatures of particular things in there, and it unpacked this firmware file. So it gives us a few things like the Linux kernel and so on, but it also gives us a JFFS2 file system. So it's a typical flash file system. And with that, we gain access to a Linux system. So we can look at all the files, we can read the configuration, we can see how it works. And as a reverse engineer, as a security consultant, that gives us me, it gives me that insight into how the device works. And it, it was really quite helpful. It was running a massive monolithic binary. Um, it did very little outside of that, it loaded one massive binary. And then that binary in turn loaded a thing called a .mxe file. Examination of that file found it was JavaScript. And that JavaScript um, did everything on the device. So we're talking the user interface. So that's all of that rich user interface on the device, the cloud connectivity, so connecting out to external servers, a local web server for controlling it locally, firmware upgrade, network, absolutely everything. But that JavaScript was 750 kilobytes in size. So really quite a sizable file. It was compressed. So you can see in that screenshot there, there's no, there's no line breaks. People compress JavaScript. Um, sometimes it's to obfuscate it to make it harder to read. Sometimes it's just to make it more efficient to load. Um, I'm not sure why they did it here, but we could expand it out. We could use something called JS Beautify to turn it back into more readable code. Um, and it was like normal JavaScript, but it also had some interesting commands, like you could run system commands, query a database and so on. And one of the things that we noticed when we looked at this was that developers assume that the code they're writing is private, that no one can see it. They assume that code is hidden. Um, and when we unpacked that JavaScript, what we found was if it couldn't connect over SSL, so you had, you had a few errors like, you know, if it couldn't validate the certificate and so on, but right down at the bottom of the massive case statement, it had unhandled SSL shit status. Now, I've written code before. Um, I wouldn't really want my boss to see something like that, never mind customers to see that. I don't think developers realize that people can see that. The other thing it did, though, it had a screensaver. So when it wasn't being a thermostat, when you weren't using it, it would show your holiday photos, something like that. But it also had a screensaver mode called son of a bitch. Now, this was hidden in the UI. You could only access it by changing um, a configuration file. And son of a bitch mode was just a screensaver, but really, really quick. Again, it's this kind of this concept that developers don't realize that reverse engineers have got the ability to look inside the code of a device like this at this level. So we can see variable names, function names, things like that. So they leak out and they give us clues to what's going on. But anyway, back to actually hacking this device. So what we did was we, we noticed it had um, these commands, system.execute command line. So it's running commands on the underlying operating system. And you've got one there that's rm plus something. So it's rm concatenated with another string. You've got copy concatenated with gallery path. When I see, as a security consultant, a command concatenated with something else, my mind jumps to something called command injection. Can I put a semicolon in that gallery path and run another command? And well, yeah, the answer's yes on this device. So what I did was I went through and I put semicolon ping and then put an IP address, 11, 11, 11, 11, 12, 12, 12, and did that throughout the config file. This was on the SD card, so I put 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way through, I put the SD card into the side of the device and loaded that configuration. And then what I found was the device started pinging 12, 12, 12, 12. So I can tell that it's running the command. So you can see it there, the path, and then you've got that ping 12, 12, 12 it was taking the gallery path and executing it as a command, just with the use of a semicolon as a command separator. So what did we do with that? Well, we took complete control of the thermostat and we wrote a little uh, IRC bot that would connect through to an IRC server and could command it. We then put a ransomware note on the screen asking for one Bitcoin. I think our exchange rate was a little bit out of whack with that one. Um, this was a few years ago, but Bitcoin was still worth a couple of thousand dollars back then. And um, we stopped the heating working. We also found that you could turn the heating on and off very rapidly because it was using triacs rather than relays. So we could turn it off hundreds of times a second 
potentially causing damage. We also found the buzzer in it went up to about 30 kilohertz, which is above human hearing range, but not above your cat's hearing range. So it could annoy cats with it. So to carry out this attack, to actually ransomware, you needed to put an SD card in the side of it and you needed to have something, a file on that SD card that had been manipulated. So it's a physical attack against the device. But in some instances, that is important. Now, I don't know how many of you watch Mr. Robot. Now, Mr. Robot is um, a series about um, kind of black hat hackers who are, are doing bad things, but for the greater good of society. Um, and in one of the episodes, what they do is they go to a company called Steel Mountain that may represent another company name, and they place a Raspberry Pi, a small computer behind the thermostat in a utility room. It takes time and effort to strip the wires, put the device in, and it leaves a trace of a device. But the thing is, this guy could have just put an SD card in the side of a thermostat that was vulnerable, loaded the config, routed it, and had a small Linux computer that he compromised on the internal network of another company. So there's a saying, physical access means game over. Um, this has been used in information security for years. So if someone's got physical access to your laptop, your computer, whatever, it's game over. Someone can do whatever they want. But the problem is with IoT, the device is already in the hands of the attacker. If you have a distributed network of LoRaWAN nodes, uh, IP connected nodes or whatever, someone can get hold of one, they can steal one, they could buy one, they can do what they want with it, and then they can attack it at their leisure. So they can get hold of sensitive information of that. So why is that important to LoRaWAN? Well, LoRaWAN has a number of different keys that are involved with the security of the communications. So the way it works is you've got two different keys. You've got a network key and an app key. The network key protects the communications between your nodes and the network server, and the app key protects it between the device and your application server. The problem is if someone can get hold of one of your nodes, there's a chance they could get hold of both the network key and the application key. How do you protect against that? How do you top, stop someone actively exploiting that? What happens if they change the data being injected into a node through to your application and things like that? I mean, I personally think LoRaWAN provides decent security in terms of a communications path, but I don't think it provides good confidentiality or integrity of the data that ends up in your application. So that's why physical access is important with LoRaWAN. The next one, identity is important. Now, this was a vulnerability we found a couple of years ago. Um, these are SWAN cameras. So they're um, battery powered wireless cameras. And we were tipped off to these by the BBC. They had a story where a guy who ran a pub opened his app to look at his cameras and he saw footage from a brewery which wasn't what he was expecting and he went to the bbc and he said well, well what, what this, this is weird you know i shouldn't be able to see someone else's cctv footage the interesting thing is in terms of security paradigms in the last few years we've really changed how we view cctv back in 2005 i don't think any of us would have considered putting a camera inside our house inside our business connected to the internet but now a lot of people do. I wouldn't, but you know, a lot of people do. So that's one of those things that we have to consider. So we went and bought one of these cameras. And one of the first things we do is we proxy the traffic from the mobile app. And we could see that it was connecting to a few different networks. This is a log file from it. But you could also see it was interacting with a service called Ozvision. So this is a third party system. Now, I'd actually had a bit of an interaction with Ozvision in the past through looking at another camera. And what we'd found was that when you look in the app, each camera you have is identified by a serial number. So SWN SWAN, followed by, um, I think it's eight digits or nine digits of hex after it. So every camera is identified by that serial number. And when you view that camera, it's sending that serial number through to an API at the other end and viewing it. So we thought, well, what happens if we change that serial number of a camera we own to another person's serial? So we used a really, really simple proxy. Um, this is a piece of free software you can download called Charles that works on Mac OS. Uh, BERT proxy works in Windows. And all we did was we swapped one serial number for another one. These were both cameras we owned. It's really important from a legal perspective that we 
have control over everything you look at. So we had two cameras, two different serial numbers, but connected to two accounts. And we swapped that serial number. Um, we did it with a kind of high profile security researcher on Twitter called Scott Helm. And what we found was by swapping that serial number, we could view the camera in his house. So the only thing linking that app through to the device was a serial number with nine hex digits. It's not, not a very big search space. It's not very random. It's certainly not an AES key, 128 bits in length. So this is a problem we see a lot in IoT. Um, quite often devices will have a MAC address. Um, it's incredibly common that something connecting over Wi-Fi or, or wired Ethernet will use its MAC address to identify itself through to a cloud platform. So your device comes along, ID 79A012, and it says, hi, I'm device 79A012. And the platform will say, yeah, hi, cool, it's you. The problem is, as an identity, we can just clone that. As an attacker, I can take that MAC address, which is which is broadcast, sorry, Siri's talking to me. Um, it's just broadcast out. You can read it off the local network. You can sniff it if it's on Wi-Fi. So an attacker can come along and come along and clone that MAC address. So we see this quite a lot. The other problem is that MAC addresses are innumerable. So the first three bytes of a MAC address are called the OUI, the Organizational Unit Identifier. I forget what these things are called. So we've already lost three bytes of, of randomness in that identifier. So it comes down to those last three bytes. So we've gone from two to the 48, which is quite a big number, down to two to the 24. But quite often what you find is only those last two bytes are used. So now we're down to two to the 24, um, uh, sorry, two to the 16 which is 65,000 IDs. Now, if I can work out a way of finding out which ones of those IDs are valid, I can connect to those devices and do bad things to them. So we often look for a vulnerability called enumeration. So I'll go through to a web API, some kind of platform, and say, hi, I'm device 79A012. And if the platform says to me, hi, device 79A012, I know that device is real and I can interact with it. If I say I'm device 79DDFA, and then the server says back to me, I've got no idea who you are, then we know that device isn't real and connected. So we've got an enumeration vulnerability. So what we used with SWAN was a combination of those two. We used the web application to enumerate devices to find valid IDs. We could send about a thousand requests a second. So for enumerating those 16 million IDs, it wouldn't be particularly long. So now we found the valid IDs and now we could view the cameras of anybody connected to that platform. It's clearly a bad thing. We could also route those cameras remotely via that same um, proxy, um, which, you know, it starts getting catastrophic at that point. So generally what we're looking for when we look at a device is that it doesn't just have an identity. It doesn't just have a, a, a number like that. It has a cryptographically assured identity, something really strong that we can challenge. We can say to that device, sign this bit of data with your private key and then I'll trust you. It never transmits that private key. No one else knows what that private key is, but we've got its corresponding public key. So it's messages signed with those private key. Um, LoRaWAN doesn't really provide for this um, at the kind of application level, unfortunately. Um, so it's important to remember that identity can be cloned. We can take an ID of a device. So a LoRaWAN EUI, we can take that, an EUI of a device, and it's possible the application server will just trust any EUI. It won't check that that data has been signed. It's not, it's not authenticated. We've used this a few times in the past. Um, a common one we've done is we've taken a telematics unit, a TCU, out of a vehicle. And what we found is that telematics unit connects over GSM. And then that GSM connection uses something called an APN, an access point name. That's the bridge between the GSM network and the IP network. So we connected that APN server. It then makes an SSL connection out. And that SSL connection goes through to a server, a telematics server. And then we send HTTP requests out over that SSL tunnel. What we've found in the past, though, is that that GSM and that APN part of the connection are completely decoupled from the HTTP and the SSL parts and we can access other servers within that company's internal network. So we've taken a telematics unit from a vehicle, we've pulled the SIM card from it, 
put it in a USB modem connected to a laptop, and then we've managed to connect it to their internal network and attack it from outside. So it's important that you trust the identity of device all the way down to the very, very lowest levels. Otherwise, really, really bad things can happen. The next one I'm going to talk about is key distribution. And again, this comes up in LoRaWAN. If you've got hundreds of devices that have all got their own private key that corresponds to their identity, how do you get those public keys that correspond to those through to the server so that they trust them? Well, we could transmit those public keys. We could send them over the channel in some way and say, well, trust this device. Here's my public key. Trust me. The problem is you need to authenticate that channel. You only need to provision devices that are genuine onto your network. And with LoRaWAN, this becomes a really, really complex when you've got a massive distributed network of network gateways all over the country receiving LoRaWAN communications from lots and lots of different systems. How do you deal with that? Well, normally when we're using the internet, we do that when we're communicating with different channels, um, different websites, things like, if you go to barclays.com, your web browser will trust barclays.com. How does it do that? Well, it uses something called transitive trust. We trust that someone else trusts Barclays. We trust the certificate authority on our computer trusts Barclays. And we do this day to day throughout our lives. We meet other people and they say, I trust Eve, therefore you should trust Eve. So people will form these trust relationships based on someone else's trust. And we do that with computers. So a server is told to trust the certificate authority. That certificate authority signs a device key, and then the server can implicitly trust that device. It doesn't have to get the public key from that device. It has to see it's been signed by someone else it trusts. And this can really simplify key management. But I'll be honest, I don't think LoRaWAN's quite got this nailed in those terms. It needs to be added as a secondary layer. So when you've got these devices made by tens of makers, so you're gonna have things made by things, things made by Seed Studio in Hong Kong, different devices made by ARM and so on. How do you actually build a trust authority across all those devices? How do you say, well, I should trust this device on my network? Do you explicitly do it? Do you take the public key from that device yourself and trust it? Or do you use a certificate authority? Again, these things aren't really answered. Now, I think a really, really good example of this is with a system called Flarm. Now, Flarm is a traffic awareness system um, that's used on small aircraft. Um, so you're probably familiar with flight radar and other systems like that that show commercial flights. Um, that uses a system called ADSB. Uh, every aircraft transmits its position. There's a network of Raspberry Pis with SDRs all over the place receiving that data, publishing it to a network, and you can see where those planes are. But little planes don't have that. So there's a system called Flarm, and they sell boxes that are between the range of maybe 800 pounds upwards and up to about a couple of thousand. You fit them to your plane, and it allows other small planes with that system fitted to see that you're there, to see your position, and thereby not drive into you or fly into you, as it's probably more common in a plane. Um, so, you know, this, this is... Um, a really, really dull picture of uh, flight radar, but this is the kind of thing that Flarm allows you to do. Now, the problem was was that when you've got devices in 100, 150,000 aircraft or whatever, you have to somehow secure the communications between those. So there's two different things there. You might need to encrypt the data, but you'll also probably need to make sure the data is authentic. Has this data been sent from a genuine aircraft from a genuine device, or as is someone spoofing those? Imagine if we could fill the air with fake aircraft, that would clearly be a bad thing. But these are devices all over the place. A plane from Belgium might fly to the UK. How does a plane in the UK know it can trust that device from Belgium? How have they exchanged keys? How have they built that trust relationship? Well, it turns out with Flarm that on their original version, what they did was they just had a hard-coded key across all devices. And what they did was they made it obscure. They stopped us being able to access that key. So they locked the microcontroller on the device to stop us reading. They prevented us from reading it. But someone with more effort and skill than me went and reverse engineered that. So they found out what these keys were. So now you could transmit and receive these flam messages between planes. So they're relying on obscurity there. It's not a genuine 
security mechanism. Um, and this is saying Kirchhoff's principle, principle, I don't know really how you say it, a crypto system should be secure if everything about the system except the key is public knowledge. I completely subscribe to this. Protocols, um, cryptographic algorithms should all be published and be secure regardless of that. Um, now, maybe maybe Flam had subscribed to this, but the problem was that even the key was public knowledge, so it doesn't really work. You may have also heard of the saying security through obscurity. So security through obscurity is the reliance on the secrecy of design or implementation as the main method as providing security. Now, I think that Flam fell fairly squarely into this with their protocol there. They had a hard-coded key that was common across all devices. They were relying on that remaining obscure. And they have got a new system. They have updated their system. We've not managed to reverse engineer it yet. So it's an interesting area of work. The thing is, it's important to bear in mind that security by obscurity is bad, but security with obscurity isn't. So there'd be no harm in every device having its own keys and making those keys hard to get. That would mean I'd have to attack one plane to get the keys off that single plane to spoof position of a single plane. Now, I think LoRaWAN suffers from these same issues to a certain extent. Um, back to that IO Active paper, they had hard-coded keys in open source code. So they found this, they went to GitHub and they looked and they found that there are LoRaWAN projects out there that every device has the same key. So whether that's the app key or the network key, exactly the same across all of them. Um, the other thing is easy to guess keys or keys with low entropy. It's very, very common um, to find that people use things like the time as a seed for keys. They'll just say, what's the time? I'll take a hash of that. Here's my key. Problem is that's a limited source of entry. Other things they use an analog to digital converter and take an input from there. And that may only have two to the 12 values. So again, it's much more predictable than it should be. So I think LoRaWAN has to make sure that keys are different for every device. And if that device is compromised, it doesn't have any impact on other devices. Um, and I think these are big challenges that we don't really know how to solve at the moment. Um, and I hope as more LoRaWAN stuff becomes commercial, which is what we're starting to see, um, there's a lot of hobbyist things at the moment, but there's not as many massive commercial projects. But I hope we start seeing those commercial projects come along and start to answer these questions in interesting ways. So I hope that was interesting. Um, I hope you learned something from that. Um, I hope I wasn't too negative. And if anyone's got any questions, I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with this at the moment or if we're just going to move on to the next next uh, presentation. Um, maybe Andy or Simon can answer that one. I can. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, the GoToWebinar has a questions feature which uh, causes stuff to appear on my screen. So if you'd like to do that, you can use that feature. Uh, or if you'd like to uh, use your own voice, um, you can press a button to, to put your hand up virtually uh, and then I will flip uh, your microphone uh, and you can speak. Uh, alternatively, if you're on Twitter, you can also tweet at BCSOSSG and I'll read out your question that way. We do, in fact, already have a question, um, and this is from Andy Bennett. Uh, how do the bandwidth sharing and limitation guidelines influence the types of security that can be implemented? Um, so, it, okay, so if we if we maybe abstract that a little bit further to saying um, these devices are resource constrained. Um, so that's in terms of bandwidth, power, um, and computational resources. Um, I think they're capable enough that we can do everything we need to in them. Um, I mean, I can't actually see where, I've got a little um, ESP32 device that, that does LoRaWAN, and it's incredibly capable. Um, I don't think there's, any real constraints that would stop us doing these things securely. I think it's possible that people can use them as excuses um, to not do things securely. Um, one, of the, one of the really big challenges we do see is the onboarding of LoRaWAN devices. So that is, how do I take a device and provision it to a given platform? 
securely. And I don't think you can really do that in band. Um, I don't think there's really that facility. Um, so what we're seeing is things like um, out of band communications over a web API over a phone being used to provision those devices. I'm not sure if that really answers it. Great, thanks Andrew. Uh, any further questions? Any more hands up? Let me check my Twitter. Um, of course, I'm about on Twitter pretty much all of the time. Um, so if anybody wants to ask me anything, uh, Cyber Gibbons on Twitter, and I'll probably come back to you. 